Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the latest version of the Lunchtime Hot Topics. Uh, the agenda today, we're going to broadly cover the Every Student Succeeds Act. We also want to give an update on Title I school-wide. We are going to, uh, latest and greatest, we're going to add one more item at the end. Uh, just an update on the ELPA 21 assessment that will be coming up soon. So, again, throughout this presentation, if you have questions, please submit them to lunchtime at ksde.org. That way we have uh, um, items that we need to follow up on. I am Colleen Riley, the <laughs> director. No, just kidding. <laughs> Colleen Riley's with me here. This is Brad Newenswinter. Colleen's with me here, and we're going to walk through the Every Student Succeeds Act, just some highlighted. Um, first of all, uh, we're not going to read these word for word, but back home when you're visiting with uh, your staff, uh, your board, or just even familiarizing yourself, we've, we've added a little bit here just on the history of ESSA. Obviously, it came out in 2001, supposed to be reauthorized in 2007, uh, but finally, um, you know, in 2011, the the president allowed states to seek some flexibility under uh, no child left behind with the waivers which is what we've been working on under the last few years um, but finally this summer both house and senate passed their own versions they conferenced and then in december uh, the president signed it so I'm going to turn it over a little bit to Colleen, but we'll kind of tag team on this. But we just want to give you some highlights of what um, might be changes, things that we're going to have to work on. Um, they're still working on uh, regulations, but we're going to um, kind of walk through some of the highlights. Colleen? Great. Thanks, Brad. And, mm -hmm. and just so you know, we've got a number of people from within KSDE that are working on numerous work groups um, looking at what the uh, Congressional Act uh, actually says and what are the um, priorities that we need to be uh, keenly aware of as we move through the rest of this year and transition into the next year. But basically, the key priorities that are included in the ESSA include the maintenance of annual assessments. We will continue to give assessments as we have. We will be able to have increased flexibility to have some design with our school accountability system, any school interventions and supports for students. We do have greater flexibility to work with our local stakeholders, such as you in the field, in order to develop our education evaluation system and supports. And there is um, the possibility of increased flexibility in the use of federal funds. The, uh, <clears throat> just looking at the assessments, there is still a requirement that we have the, the same footprint in Kansas on when we administer the math, English language arts, and science assessments. Math and English language arts is in grades three through eight and once in high school. And then science, has to be administered at least once in the grades three through five, six and nine, and then 10 through 12. Um, there is um, authority to the US Secretary to provide up to seven states um, that wanna do something innovative with assessments. Um, right now, I don't know um, with conversations in Kansas, if that's a direction that we may wanna look at, but, um, Again, with our emphasis on the board's new vision and, and direction about other outcomes, uh, this hasn't come up yet, but it, you know, it's always up for discussion, but that is in the new law. Um, and then there's also um, gives authority to states to really look at how often do they assess and the length of those assessments. So. <clears throat> So with our accountability system, the um, update of ESSA replaces what we currently are under with um, AYP. Um, we've been fortunate in Kansas to be implementing the Kansas Flexibility Waiver, um, which had um, allowed us to do a, a, a different way of measuring our, our students' progress. 
um, it, it, rather than using AYP. But under the new ESSA, states will need to establish ambitious, designed, state-designed long-term goals, and we will have measurements that will will do uh, midterm progress uh, for all students in subgroups. We will still need to make sure that we are measuring academic achievement on state assessments. And as you know, in Kansas, that is looking at how our students compare on our career and ready assessments. We'll also be looking at how our students do with our graduation rates and what is the progress of students who are in English language learner, in the in English language learners. As far as accountability, um, again, the flexibility and the thing that we like about the new ESSA is even though we still have the same footprint for the grades and the, the, the assessment, how we use the results of those assessments, we get a design as a state. One of them, as far as uh, accountability, uh, we have to be able to meaningly differentiate schools. We look at academic proficiency on state assessments, graduation rates, uh, English language proficiency, Growth or another statewide academic indicator for uh, grades K through eight, that could be attendance like we've done in the past. And then it says not less than one other state indicator of school quality or student success. And down there, and, and additionally, 95% of students need to participate. Not, that doesn't change. But when we talk about another state indicator and you look down at the bottom, just kind of um, some examples, what it's saying is that other indicator can't substantially outweigh the other ones. So another component of the updated ESSA includes comprehensive support and improvement. So we are going to be identifying Title I schools based on our state accountability index. We will also be looking at high schools and um, any schools that have subgroups that are underperforming. The nice thing about this is we're going to be able to determine a lot of this um, as a state and be able to provide comprehensive support to those schools that are in the um, identified group. Included with this is what they call targeted support and, th and that would, we'll have to be looking at um, subgroups, just as we always have in the past, but we'll have to design a way of how do we want to identify schools that have subgroups that are consistently underperforming. Uh, again, it says as defined by the state, so there's a lot of work that we'll have to do behind that. Um, but again, the tests are given, how we use the results um, is, is our, however we want to design it in Kansas. One other thing I just want to mention at the top where it says lowest performing 5%. If you remember under the waiver, we had 5% priority and another 10% were focus. Under ESSA, it just says 5%. So we'll be bringing groups and teams together to talk about how do we want to do that, uh, what index, how, you know, so we get to design how we do that in Kansas. And then this last part about the SIG models are no longer required. Um, for those of you who may have worked in a school that has received a, 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 a SIG grant, there were specific models that were required by the uh, U.S. Department of Education to be implemented in schools um, based on the turnaround principles. Uh, those models will no longer be required, but improvement strategies that are evidence-based and research-based will be the ones recommended and used as we move forward with SIG grants. On teacher evaluation and support, if many of you remember that under the waiver, we were required that um, we had to have state assessments as a component of, of a teacher and leader's evaluation. And in Kansas, we fought strong for two years. We were labeled as a high risk state because we didn't want to uh, say it was 50% based on one test. 
and we felt really good about what we were moving forward and find they finally approved but under ESSA there's no longer a requirement from the federal level that we even have to have it in there so we've already got a committee um, they met yesterday for the first time a committee from the field to say Let's take some of the really good work that we've done around teacher leader evaluations, but from here on out, it's what we want to do, and we don't have to follow any, get any permission, any prescription. It's what, what we want to do in Kansas. So a lot of work to be done in that, but we've already uh, started. So the transition, uh, we're, we've already started the transition. As I mentioned earlier, we've got the um, Congressional Act, we are now taking a look at that within KSDE with, with a number of work groups, taking a look at the uh, components of that. These are, as you'll remember, Title I requirements. So some of those Title I requirements stay in effect. Um, when we have any kind of new formula program grants uh, under ESSA, those will become effective July 2016. Any new competitive grants will become effective October 2016. And the accountability systems uh, using the state assessment under ESSA go into effect the 2017-18 school year. Correct. So if, if, if you think about it, we're working under a waiver right now. All of that expires this summer. And then we basically have the 16-17 school year to transition into the new law. This one here was just a, a, a letter that came out from the U.S. Department of Ed. Uh, some of this gets a little into detail, but peer review, um, that's basically saying that every state uh, has to have their assessment peer reviewed. Um, that'll be done this spring, late into, or, and then into summer. <clears throat> AMOs, uh, annual measurable objectives, we will not be needing to submit those, setting new goals this January, which is was a requirement under the waiver. Now that there's a new law, we won't be doing that. Um, they will not hold st or require states to hold districts accountable for their AMOs <clears throat> this year. Uh, report cards, we still by requirement under ESSA, have to publish annual report cards. Um, I'm not going to read all of that, but uh, most people are familiar with the report cards that we post. Also, they will not be accepting any other submissions for waiver extensions. Um, states were able to receive some renewal letters, but in a nutshell, um, if it's in our waiver, and it's in the new law, we will continue to work on it and move it forward. If it was in our waiver, but it's not found in the new law, then we no longer, we, we can if we want, but U.S. Department of Ed won't hold us accountable for anything under that. Priority and focus school list, we won't be, um, we have some options. Our goal is to stick with our timeline, and that is next year, going into August, we will be identifying, or our goal is to identify a new round of schools that need assistance uh, within the Kansas Learning Network, but we wanna follow the new guidelines of the 5%. <clears throat> and then teacher leader evaluations, again, we have a, a committee made up of people from school districts across the state we're going to start talking about what do we want to do as far as our teacher and leader evaluations and how can we look at data to see if, a, a, if an educator is having a positive effect on student learning or um, a, a negative effect. So. And the nice thing about this um, reauthorization is that the Department of Education isn't going to require states to do things that they wanted us to do. They will be available for us in the um, to be able to give us technical assistance and provide feedback and support if we choose to take it. But the nice thing is, is we, we as a state will be able to uh, develop that as we want. The thing that I, <clears throat> this slide here is, we, we kind of did it to ourselves under No Child Left Behind in the QPA days. 
to where we kind of blended and married those two things when it really the effect of it turned out to be it was all about did you hit a target and it was less about the quality assurances as we move forward with our new accreditation model and with the board's new vision about leading the world uh, in the success of each student, the, the whole Kansans can direction, requirements under ESSA will just be a sliver of, what, of where we want to go in Kansas. And yes, ESSA, you know, we'll be looking our students academically on track for success. Well, we have an assessment that will help inform that and our supports going to schools and districts with the highest needs. Other than that, we're focusing on, as a state, the board's vision. We want to lead the world in the success of each student. We'll be looking at graduation rates, post-secondary success, <laughs> kindergarten readiness, individual plans of study, all of that. But this here is just try to say, we are not going to let a federal ESSA law trump the direction that we want to go in Kansas. It'll just be a, a piece of. Again, if you have questions specifically about ESSA, we also have this link that you can send them to, um, especially so we can start finding out what questions are out there so we can be developing responses to, or in things we may not even uh, have thought of yet. Additionally, we are re, re, redesigning our Title I homepage to be specific to uh, the ESSA. So pretty soon you will start to see us adding documents and resources to that page as we are able to compile those. But for right now, please direct any questions or comments that you have to this email box. <laughs> Thank you. Now I'm going to turn things over to Teresa White and to Dean Zeitz to give you an update on Title I school-wide. Hello, this is Teresa White and Dean Zeitz. We'll be sharing with you about Title I and school-wide. And we're going to be going over some uh, general information. There's myself and there's Dean. Uh, we'll be doing an overview of the Title I school-wide. We're going to look specifically at funding flexibility uh, and include some information about waiver, supplement versus a plant, the use of funds, and then finally we're going to be talking about dispelling some of the myths and misunderstandings. And we're going to do that with uh, some of the frequent questions that come up with school-wide. So when we look at school-wide, overall, there are 10 basic required components. That has not changed since the uh, title school-wide program started. And one of the more frequent things that comes up is that most people think when they uh, go from a targeted assisted school to a school-wide that somehow or another they're going to get additional funds or more money. Uh, what it simply means is that when you go to a school-wide, instead of just looking at targeted uh, specific students, you're looking at all of your students and you're combining all of your funds together uh, to meet those needs. And so hopefully by consolidating that, you'll be able to do more services and provide uh, more assistance to your schools overall. I'm not going to read each one of these. These are the same 10 components that we've always had. And the only thing that I am going to point out is that with the comprehensive needs assessment, and we're using the uh, Kansas Star system uh, now, the comprehensive needs assessment is not a part of that uh, program. So what you will need to do is develop your own needs assessment or you can uh, copy or use any of the needs assessments that may be around or are available at other districts or through your service centers. Uh, MTSS has a needs assessment that uh, you may want to look at but that's one of the options that you will have. So I mentioned the Kansas Star system. Uh, for those of you that are already school-wide, uh, the Kansas Star system simply allow, will allow you to integrate into that system, but you will continue to do an annual report, uh, and it will be listed as a supplemental report in the Kansas Star system. 
And so you will complete that once a year. Uh, it's the same basic one page report that you've done before. So with that in mind, those are all the components and all the information uh, in terms of the school-wide and those basic uh, requirements. So let's take a look at the school-wide flexibility and Dean's going to start that discussion. Hello. Um, well, so as most of you that are probably on this webinar already realize that a school-wide um, program may use Title I funds for any activity that supports the needs that are so that supports a need identified in the comprehensive needs assessment. And um, just like Teresa, I'm not going to spend a lot of time just repeating everything that you're seeing on the on the screen. But um, there's a couple of key points that we want to make sure that that uh, that you're aware of and that you understand, um, and that you understand the, the really the flexibility that already exists under the existing um, ESS, ESEA No Child Left Behind, and that continues um, with ESSA going forward. Um, first and foremost is when you're in a school-wide school building as opposed to a targeted assistant school building, the supplement not supplant really doesn't <clears throat> apply to, uh, to those funds. And, and here's what I mean by that. In a school-wide building, as long as you're using your funds to meet the, the needs identified um, within your comprehensive needs assessment, um, you are meeting the grant objective of those Title I funds. There isn't a requirement that you only serve a particular subgroup or, or subgroups of, of kiddos, uh, which really allows for that flexibility to serve your kids in the way that best addresses your needs based on your needs assessment. Now, so for instance, that may be in your building, that may look like um, some additional uh, uh, core, uh, that may, addi may be additional core related activities um, that could then be paid out of out of title funds. Uh, where supplement not supplant really comes into play is not at the building level, but more at the district level where we do still, there is still a requirement that there's equitable funding uh, between the buildings, comparable funding rather, between the buildings, so that your non-title buildings aren't getting resources, uh, aren't, your title buildings aren't getting less resources uh, less basic state and local resources than your non-title buildings. So there's there's not a supplanting at that level, but within your building, um, it's it shouldn't be an issue. So you can really focus on meeting the needs of the kids uh, based on the needs assessment rather than tracking the details of the funds. Uh, a school-wide program shall use Title I funds to supplement the amounts of funds that would, and, and this is again, uh, so this this is from a letter from the U.S. Department of Education that came out on uh, July of 2015 uh, that really includes some, some nice examples, real world examples of how Title I funds may be used in a school-wide building uh, setting to address your needs and to really dispel some, some myths about how funds can and cannot be consolidated and, and the options that you have. Um, and that letter is uh, posted on the KSDE website for your reference as well. But um, Again, these aren't new flexibilities, but um, we think it's important to, to, to explain that, that these flexibilities are there. Um, and at the end of the day, as long as you are using your funds to meet the needs that are identified in a comprehensive needs <coughs> assessment, um, you're, that, you're meeting the purpose of, of, those, of that grant and, and the use of those funds. And, and so let me give a, an example of some things that uh, maybe are a little outside the box that people don't usually think of when they think of using funds. Um, we've got some examples up here on the screen about you know, increased learning time and family literacy programs, school climates, et cetera. But um, let me give you a real world example that, um, that we've heard from at least one other state, and I'm sure that there's, there's others too. Um, we, one uh, interesting example we've heard is uh, a large urban district um, in, uh, when they did their comprehensive needs assessment, uh, a number of the buildings, what they found was one of their greatest challenges was really in engaging the parents. And it, was because, it wasn't because the parents didn't want to be involved and engaged, but because of their schedules and because of uh, their, their limited ability to actually get to the school building, it was difficult um, to have that, that parental engagement component. And so what, the, what that school chose to do was they actually used uh, Title I dollars to pay for bus passes for their, their uh, 
parental engagement consultants, I forget the term that they use for it, but, but, but so that those individuals can actually basically just ride the buses throughout the day and they would um, use that time, that travel time, to actually meet up with the parents and to mm -hmm. review, um, you know, plans for the students and, and really engage them. And, and, you know, it's that kind of, and through that out of the box thinking, they really did see some, some results and some, some uh, great um, increases in participation by the parents. So, and that's just one of, of many, many examples. There's a lot more out there, and there's some good examples even in that that guidance letter that uh, that the U.S. Department of Education put out back in uh, in July. And so, from that, this is a nice transition then into some of the myths and misunderstandings that surround Title I funds and, and what you can and can't do. And <coughs> we're going to go. Teresa and I are going to go back and forth on on these six myths, and um, I'm going to kick it back over to Teresa. So when we look at the very first myth, Title I funds may only be used to support reading and math instructions. Uh, the letter very clearly says that, uh, obviously, with school-wide, you're looking at all academic areas. Uh, and that's where your needs assessment comes in so critical uh, as you look at this improvement process basically because whatever your needs assessment is that's going to direct and guide what you're going to be doing with your schools and with your students so uh, it is not limited just to math and reading and uh, number two title one funds may be used only to provide remedial instruction uh, here again there's a tremendous amount of flexibility in what you as the building uh, want to do to help out your kiddos it's not just about bringing up the lower end it's also about preparing these students um, that um, to to excel um, and so rather than only focusing on remedial instruction it is also possible to um, use the funding to provide uh, classes for advanced placement training and and to uh, help students succeed in uh, more rigorous and and uh, uh, more rigorous environments even so when you look at number three, Title I funds may only be used to serve low achieving students. Uh, realizing that Title I uh, and its purpose and initial uh, being was to work with our low uh, performing students and provide them with equal footing for everyone. The funds may be used to upgrade the entire educational uh, program in the school. And so in doing so, you're going to benefit uh, and use your Title I funds to address the needs of all kids. However, you know, again, being consistent with the Title I purpose, the reason for the upgrade in the entire school system is to improve the achievements, not just for your low-income, low-achieving or low-income students, but for all students. Number four, uh, Title I funds may only be used for instruction. Um, this kind of gets back to what I was talking about a moment ago, where as long as the intervention or, you know, you know I shouldn't even say intervention, as long as you're using the funds, to meet a need that's been identified in your comprehensive needs assessment, you can use the funds for that um, uh, in, in general. Uh, so, for instance, uh, you know, I use the, the example of parental engagement, but it could be to meet the needs of uh, improving school climate. Um, you know, there's uh, it could be used to um, so it could be used for uh, positive uh, behavior supports and interventions, um, any number of things, as long as it ties back, as long as it's evidence-based and ties back to what's in that comprehensive needs assessment. So your Title I funds may be used to support children below kindergarten or the age of compulsory education. Uh, and this ties perfectly in with, uh, again, some of the new and, uh, and integrated approaches that we're having in terms of pre-K uh, education. And so school-wide can be used to operate um, in the whole or in part a preschool program to help improve those students' cognitive uh, thinking, their health, their social emotional outcomes, uh, and basically just prepare them for as they grow and as they get older in the educational system. So Title I funds can be used for your preschool program. Uh, and as you look at that process, it's a wonderful opportunity to help those students that struggle uh, because of not being prepared uh, when they start school. And uh, finally, for number six for the myths that we have here, Individuals with Disabilities Act Part B funds may not be consolidated in a school-wide program. Again, that's a myth. Uh, so um, here in, in Kansas, right now, we only have one district that actually takes advantage of this. But you do, um, as you districts do have, and vis-a-vis you know, -vis the buildings then, do have flexibility to consolidate a portion of their IDA uh, federal special education funds 
into their consolidated funds in a school-wide building. Um, and that's actually done through the application for IDA funds that would be completed by your special education director. So of course you're going to, this would be in coordination with your uh, your special ed director, whether you're in a, a district that, that provides those services directly or whether you're in a, a cooperative or, or an interlocal. Um, and the, when I say a portion of the funds, it's you can consolidate up to a maximum of of that portion of funds that um, as it relates to the number of kids, students with disabilities in your building. So let me let me back that up just a little bit. So what we would look at is the total number of students with disabilities within the district or the LEA being served, uh, local education agency being served, and we would look at the number of students with disabilities in as identified in that particular school-wide building and the maximum amount that could be consolidated out of those out of the big pot of IDA funds for the district is that proportion. So if let's say 10% of the students with disabilities within a district are in your building, you could reserve up to 10% of the IDA funds um, for consolidation in the school into the school-wide program. And so why would you want to do that? Um, once those funds are, are consolidated, um, they can be used to meet any of the needs, again, identified in the comprehensive needs assessment. And the advantage of that, um, it, it could be that, um, that it really allows you to address the needs of, of all your students on, that, on a whole student basis. Um, you don't have to worry about pulling out the, these kiddos um, for special education, they're gonna receive that reading intervention here in this room from this instructor, because it's just easier to do that rather than to to break out the time and effort logs between the two, and and also and so and so having a separate reading intervention that looks the same um, for uh, kiddos that are in another in a separate room. Um, again, it really all ties back to what's in the comprehensive needs assessment, um, and uh, and of course we understand that, um, uh, and then of course you know the. Uh, uh, Needs with students with disabilities um, still all have to be addressed according to their their IEP. So you know those things don't go away, but it does does give you more flexibility with the federal funds to address those needs um, on a school wide basis. Um, that was last and miss um, a couple of, of parting thoughts uh, or notes um, that are kind of relevant, especially with uh, with ESSA coming up. Um, as we mentioned, there's not significant changes um, with regards to the school wide at least going forward. Um, and um, one thing in particular that I, I think that people will be happy to hear in Kansas is that, you know, in, in Kansas we previously were an EdFlex state where you could actually qualify to be a school-wide building even if you were below the, the poverty threshold set in, out in No Child Left Behind. That uh, flexibility has actually been codified in the new law and the state, KSDE, the Kansas Department of Education, has the flexibility to um, allow a building at any poverty level to be granted school-wide status. And so even if you are at a much lower poverty level, um, we would encourage you, if, if you believe this is a good choice for you, to, to go that route. Um, and Teresa White, of course, will work with you to, to assist with that. Um, and then, um, you know, as you work through these, um, if you as you have questions, please reach out to whether it's Teresa White or myself, Dean Zeitz, um, and we're happy to, we won't, we're here to be a resource for you. And, and we find that in most instances, um, people that talk to us realize that there's actually much more flexibility than they probably realized there was for, for how you can do this and make it work. Teresa, do you have other? No, just want to remind you that we've attached the uh, July 2015 letter with the resources and the PowerPoint. And we hope that you will look at that. There are a number of resources that are mentioned in there. And by all means, feel free to contact myself or Dean uh, with additional questions or if you need assistance with any of this. We want this to be a good process for you. And we thank you for your participation with us today. Hello. My name is Julie Ewing, and I am the program consultant for the English language learners. I would like to update you on our English language proficiency assessment today. KSDE has announced a new vendor for ELPA 21, and it is Questar. Our testing window has changed from um, when it was previously announced. It is now February 22nd to April 1st. Questar hosted a webinar on January 15th 
for technology support. And they also hosted another webinar uh, this morning, January 20th, for test administrators and ELL directors. Both webinars are or will be posted on the KSDE ELPA assessment webpage in case you missed those. As previously scheduled, Phyllis and I will give an ESOL update on Tuesday, January 26th at 9 a.m. To join the meeting, you can go to our Adobe Connect, and this is the same link that has been used in the past webinars. But just to remember, attendance is limited to 100 people, so if you can't join, the recording will be posted on the Title III ESOL resources webpage um, as soon as we can get it up there. And this update will focus on ELPA 21, including um, question and answers about the two vendor webinars that we've previously had. We do have a fact sheet that is on the KSGE ELPA assessment webpage, and it is on there now. And please continue to check your email for further announcements that will be sent on the assessments and ESOL listservs. And the subject is going to be ELPA 21 update. Just a reminder, a student with a significant cognitive disability will also, who is also an ELL student will participate in the ELPA 21 assessment this year. The student's IEP will guide how the student will access the ELPA 21 assessment. And this year will be a baseline year for measuring future growth. If you have any questions, please contact um, myself or Phyllis. You have our contact information, email, or call us, and we will be glad to um, get all of your questions answered. Thank you very much.